A call came in that there was another disappearance on Lock Hill Road. My whole town was buzzing about a person named Josephine, an old lady that had the tendency to be a little bit of a pain in the butt for cashiers, but otherwise a quiet one in town. Apparently, the patrol that frequents near that road found her car in a ditch and saw no traces of her anywhere. The police went to check her house and saw that she wasn't there either. There was only one conclusion that we all had to come up with. The road has claimed another victim. As for my name, I'm only going to tell you that it's Adam, and I'm here to explain to you that there's something absurdly bizarre about the road. Lock Hill Road is one of the oldest roads in Illinois. There isn't anything significantly special about it. On the surface, it's covered in large cracks, grass overtakes the edges, and it's surrounded by an unusually swamp-like environment. Something a little bizarre, given how up north I am. But it's also got a rap sheet that would make Ted Bundy jealous. From what I've learned in my 28 years of living in this town over the last 200 years or so, about 300 people have mysteriously disappeared. That's a significantly high number, and you're probably wondering why people would want to drive on it. Here's the thing. Nobody typically uses that road. They just find themselves on it. It's really weird, but you can find yourself suddenly on that road without warning. One moment, you'll be on the highway that's near my town, and right as you get off, you'll find yourself driving on that road. But that only happens at night. As a rule, driving at night is strongly prohibited. The only issue is that cops are less inclined to go about driving themselves, and this happens at completely random moments as well. The next question I know you are all asking is, why would any of us want to live here then? Well, the thing is that there's a mine nearby. It's a salt mine, and a lot of money is gained from it. You have to weigh the risk and reward factors here. There are people here who, despite the danger, are making bank. I don't know how much a typical salt mine will pay, but I think the extra danger of the road is the reason why the income for locals is so much better here. So, for the most part, we prefer not to talk about it. Now, you're probably wondering why I am here. I clearly don't work at the mine, but instead, I am a neighborhood watch patrolman. Since disappearances can happen if people are caught driving, I, as well as others, found ourselves working alongside the local police to keep people off the roads for their own safety. It seems that whatever effect the road can create, it doesn't work if you're walking on two feet. So, my job is relatively safe. Sure, I don't get any weapons training other than a baton and mace, which is why I prefer to regularly work out and make sure that criminals, usually rowdy teenagers, don't have a good advantage over me or any of my partners. But I'm here to tell you about how I got sloppy and nearly paid the price with my life. It was your typical Wednesday, and I was with my friends at the police station, getting ready to sign in to let the department know that we were going to be working today. That's when Officer Smith, not her real name, by the way, approached me and said in her smooth, southern voice, Now you boys try and have a good night. We've been getting some reports that there's been a gang of kids that keep breaking house windows. So far they haven't entered anything, but I think they're trying to create an atmosphere of tension. I stood there silently always having difficulty talking to her. She was serious about her job, and wasn't too kind to anyone who was caught slacking, but she cared to a great degree. I mustered up the courage to say, We'll do. We got our mace and batons ready. Good. But still, if they turn out to be more hostile than usual, I need you fellas to call us ASAP. It wasn't lost on me that even if we did call for the actual police officers, it would still take a good while for them to arrive, giving any of these troublemakers a chance to escape from us. No cars at night, remember. One of my partners, Derek, replied with the usual enthusiasm. Hey, don't sell us short, ma'am. Adam and I have been doing this for two years. We're basically experts at this point. She noticed his smug expression and quickly shut it down. I've been a cop for seven years. In that time, I believe 13 people have gone missing. And many of you neighborhood watch patrolmen have been hurt, sometimes severely, by these thugs. Call us. 
she ended it with a stern warning. Derek always had this issue with overconfidence, and I often think that's why he was never able to get a girlfriend. I think he's just overdoing it half the time, thinking that it impresses people. Still, this is the first time I've actually known this much about Officer Smith. Seven years is a long time, and for that many people to have gone missing, I can tell that's got to weigh heavily on her mind. But our patrol went on as usual. We did our regular routine for the first few hours with nothing more than warning people that they can't get in their cars, because in about an hour, the sun would have completely set by then. Sure, there's an entire hour, but why take the chance? But around the time when the sun had already descended, I got a call on my radio by a woman that said, Neighborhood Patrol Unit Number 9, do you read me? Neighborhood Patrol Unit Number 9, we can hear you loud and clear. Number 9, we've been getting some odd reports of a car that's driving around. It was reported by a civilian caller, but all police officers who responded to the area haven't been able to track their location. We need you to stay alert. The last coordinates of their whereabouts were in your general location, so keep your eyes peeled. Dispatch, we'll keep our eyes on the lookout for the driver. We'll have to flag them down and hope that they stop. Copy. Good hunting. There was always anxiety-inducing to hear that someone was driving around. They had to be someone who had come off the highway. Well, looks like we gotta chase someone down on foot today. Derek happily agreed. Come on, man. I don't even want to think about going after someone in a car. Yeah, but at least it's something to do. He chuckled. I wasn't amused. Frankly speaking, this was only a job for me. Sure, I don't get paid as much as a cop, but it's less dangerous. Now that I'm being tasked with stopping a vehicle, this is going to prove way above my pay grade. I almost can't remember the last time I had to deal with a driver. But the night dragged on as usual, and still no sign of the vehicle. I was pretty much convinced that they must have gone off on some other section of the town, but Derek was remaining vigilant. He took this job way too seriously. Or perhaps he wasn't taking it seriously enough. You hear that? He abruptly said. We both quieted down and tried to listen carefully. There was nothing for a brief few seconds, other than the sound of crickets in the distance and an owl hooting. But then, there was a sudden screeching of tires nearby. We had our driver and quickly started running towards whatever direction it was that we heard it from. Despite having flashlights and reflectors on, I somehow found myself alone. I shouted out for Derek at the top of my lungs. I heard his distant reply. Adam? Adam, where'd you go? I followed his voice and saw that he had gone down the next street over. Derek, what are you doing over there? You were supposed to stay with me the whole time. I shouted. I was trying my best to hide my anger from him. He shouldn't have broken off just to chase down a car. What do you mean? You broke off from me. He shouted back. You were supposed to go down Amberg Street. He was about to respond, but the screeching of those tires could be heard coming down my road. I looked to my left and saw a large Chevrolet speeding towards me. I jumped out of the way just in time before they hit me. They knocked over some trash cans in a mailbox and appeared to be driving with delirium. Now I was having suspicions about this person. Derek, I saw the driver. I think they're drunk and they're trying this car out for a joyride since no one else is around. He sounded confused. Uh, what's the protocol for this again? I ignored his forgetfulness and pulled out my radio to call dispatch again. Neighborhood Patrol Unit Number 9 to dispatch. We have a red Chevrolet driving erratically on Amberg Street in the local area. Over. Dispatch to Unit Number 9. Where are they headed? Over. I took a look at my compass that I always keep with me and replied. Dispatch, they're headed towards the north and don't appear to be stopping anytime soon. Over. Dispatch to unit number 9. Do not engage with the driver. We're sending over a bicycle unit to try and slow them down the best we can. We can't take risks with a vehicle. Over. Okay. We will not engage any further, but we will keep you updated. Over and out. Derek soon approached behind me and said, I get so tired of always having to use those police code words. It's so there's no confusion. You do realize that there are police officers on this channel too, right? 
Yeah, yeah, don't lose your hair over it. I was just complaining a little. I gave him a smirk, and the two of us continued on our way. Since we didn't have the responsibility of chasing after the driver, we went about our usual patrol, but with a little more alertness in our minds. But we made a bad decision to be passing by that dreaded road. It was part of our routine, and usually passing by never caused any problems. Remember, you have to be driving a car to find yourself trapped on the road. The only problem is, that as we were going by, we saw the truck. It ran off the road, and crashed into a tree. From what I could see, the silhouette of the guy was in sight. I gave Derek my radio and told him to call and tell them that we had found the driver and that they appeared to have been trying to go down Lock Hill Road. I ran over to the left side of the road where the car laid wedged up against the side of the tree. The driver's door was smashed in and I would have to climb in from the passenger side to try and save them from burning to death. When I went for the door, I briefly hesitated. The idea of getting in a car at night and being directly on Lock Hill left me with this gut feeling that kept telling me that I should just turn back and wait for first responders to arrive. But given that they were going to be arriving not by ambulance but by bicycle, and with the car slowly starting to burn, I took a deep breath and opened the door, climbing inside and reaching for the man as quickly as I could. He was knocked out cold, and I grabbed hold of his arm and shook him as much as I could to wake him up. The fire was growing, and I unbuckled his seatbelt, wrapping my arms around him, and used my legs to forcibly pull him out of the vehicle. The man was fat and a pain to try and pull out. At last, I felt the weight release, and both of us fell onto the grass below. I breathed a sigh of relief, thankful that I was able to save him just in time. I got myself back on my feet and looked over to the exit of the road. I must have fallen into a state of disbelief because I saw that there was nothing but a long stretch of road surrounded by marshland under a red moon. I turned over to the other side, a soon-to-be fleeting hope already starting to take hold of me, and saw that it was the same in the other direction. No, 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 I shouted. I wasn't even driving the car. The car wasn't moving. How could this have happened to me? This wasn't supposed to happen. As far as we all knew, if you're driving, you become snatched up by the road. At least, that's what I think the town's consensus was. Maybe everyone just assumes that that is the likely scenario. It's not like anyone's ever returns to tell us that simply being inside your car is enough to warrant whatever unusual forces are at work here. I kept pacing myself, running from one end to the other hoping that maybe I just misjudged the distance and I could easily still walk out and find Derek. But besides the eerie red light coming from above, all I saw was darkness. The drunken man groaned, then quickly caught my attention, and I ran back over to him. He was still alive, but not fully awake yet. Then I remembered my radio and reached for it. I felt nothing in my pocket and instantly remembered that I handed my radio off to Derek. Seeing that that wasn't going to work, I went for my phone next, but there was no signal. I was completely stranded. In a fit of rage, I started swearing up and down out of the frustration of being caught in this. I guess it's true what they say, no good deed goes unpunished. I should have listened to my instincts and told myself not to intervene. I should have left this guy and waited for backup like they always tell us. And now I'm trapped on this road with a drunkard, who I was now more than happy to abandon. He started moving around as his eyes opened. He was awake and clearly saw the burning wreckage that was his truck. His voice was rough, having a noticeable smoker's voice. Hey, what happened to my piece of junk? You crashed into a tree, you idiot. I alerted him to my presence. He turned around and became instantly belligerent with me. Holding up both of his fists at me, he fiercely said, Who are you called an idiot? I wasn't intimidated. The fact of the matter is that I work out regularly, and when I was five, my parents thought it was a good idea for me to take self-defense classes. Thank you, Mom and Pa. He threw one of his fists my way, and I was able to dodge it backing up and having my own fists ready. 
When he saw that he missed, he threw his other one, only for me to grab it and easily pull them inwards when my back turned and flipped him over me, letting him hit the ground hard. Even though he was drunk and probably didn't feel the pain all that much, his body was too heavy for him to have any decent motor function, and I believe he passed out again. Seeing that he wasn't going to be a problem anymore, I walked around, staying relatively close to the man, trying to see if I could get a signal by changing location. This went on for about twenty minutes or so, and despite my best efforts, I was left with nothing. The unusual silence was broken by a few sharp coughs. I guess he was due to wake up again. I stood over him, expecting him to go into another rant about what I had said earlier, but he seems to have had a mental reset. Uh, who are you? My name's Adam. I'm part of the neighborhood patrol. You had a car wreck because you were drunk, am I correct? I said in my best stoic voice. He got back to his feet quickly and smelled horrible. I only just now noticed because I was distracted by my situation. The sting of his alcoholic breath was much too strong for me, forcing me to take a few steps back. I only had a few drinks, he slurred. Only? How much is only? I let my anger slip out. Uh, five? Seven, maybe? Of what? I ordered. Hennessy. This guy was a moron. Now I was trapped on this godforsaken road with a man who had only half a functioning brain. I walked to one side of the road and had to take a wild guess as to which way it would be best. I wasn't about to sit out there in the dark with this guy. I could only rely on the illumination of the red moonlight. I wanted to save the battery on my flashlight, so I thought it best not to use it at this moment. Look, I said, we need to start walking in a direction to get us out of here. Maybe there is a way to escape, but we have to come to a decision on which way. I guess he remembered my remark from earlier, after all, because he said, I ain't going anywhere with you, kid. You call me a moron. I rolled my eyes. This guy was as petty as a child, and yet calls me a kid. Listen closely. You're on that road we're not supposed to be on. You got me roped into this, and I'm going to make a decision. Either come with me, or stay here and wait for rescue. Not that they'll be coming. He turned around and went back to the car. At first, I was confused as to what he was up to, but I almost had a quick heart attack when I briefly thought that he was going to pull a gun out on me. I was already preparing myself to start running when he turned around and had a beer bottle in his hand. I ain't going with you anywhere. He threw the bottle at me, narrowly hitting me in the head. It shattered on the other side of the road, and for a brief moment, I thought I heard something skitter away. Since I've been here, I haven't heard a single animal, so the idea that something was back there silently observing us made my skin crawl. Fine, I spoke. Stay here. I can't make you come with me. Let's hope that we can find you by tomorrow when the sun comes up. The heavy man flipped me off, signaling my cue to leave. I was quick to put as much distance between us as I went to the right end of the road and started my journey with only a flashlight in hand. For the most part, nothing had happened in the last five minutes, and I was content with the silence that surrounded me. Better to hear nothing than to hear something, but I would rather hear my radio crackle to life at this moment. Going a little further on, the silence was broken again, but this time, instead of the groaning coming from that guy, I heard a blood-filled scream coming from way back. That man had stayed behind, and now he was being attacked by something. It was so guttural and wrapped up in agony that already the hairs on my body were standing up. A part of me was screaming that I needed to go back and check on him, but whatever it was, it likely had already done the deed. Plus, if I go back, who's to say I won't become the next victim? There's always been something odd about this road and I have to approach it with the highest end of paranoia. My only other option was to keep pressing forward and hope that salvation is at the end. Running was starting to feel like a better option, but I refrained from it. I could easily tire myself out 
and I didn't want to be stationary. It clearly didn't provide any safety for that drunkard. I just had to keep pressing forward at a modest pace. Something has changed. It's been about three hours now, and the moon hasn't moved. And that blood-red color is hurting my eyes. I don't like to keep my eyes shut for fear that something might come out from nowhere and attack me. But the soreness is starting to get to me. What's worse is that I can hear footsteps behind me. They're light on their feet, but each step is almost echoing my pace. I sped up just a little to test out my theory, and whatever it was, it simultaneously matched me. I heard it lingering always behind me. My paranoia is starting to overtake any rational thinking that I have. But then again, nothing about this road is rational. The steps seem to be speeding up, even though I had been going at the same pace for the last ten minutes. My breathing was starting to betray me, growing louder and hoarser with each intake of the unreasonably cold air. And then, there was a steady, growing whispering that was surrounding me. Finally, having enough of the pursuit, I turned around, pointing the flashlight at as many parts of the road as I could to get a glimpse of who was following me. But it was empty. No. No. I heard something. Someone. I whispered to myself. Turning back in my original direction, the steps began again, and the whispering was only growing louder. Without a second thought, I started charging forward, done with whatever it was that was messing with me. I wanted to get away from them, but I could faintly hear their footsteps behind me. It was growing closer, even though I was now running at full speed. In my mind, I thought maybe I could fight it. Perhaps the drunk guard was caught off guard, and that's how it got him. But my legs kept moving forward. A sense of dread was keeping me in flight mode, preventing me from wanting to switch to fight mode. No matter what, one thing was for certain. I wasn't alone on this lonely road. That's perhaps one of the worst feelings. Up ahead, I saw a distant flashing. They were police flashes. As I drew closer, my pursuer's footsteps quieted down and the whispering ceased. Standing in front of me was a police officer and his vehicle behind him. Oh, thank you. I've been trapped on this road for hours. I called out to him. His voice was low and had an echo to it, which was an immediate put-off. It's okay, son. We got reports of a dispatch happening here earlier today. They sent me to try and get you. I replied, down on my knees due to exhaustion. Who? Dispatch? Yes. Upon further inspection, I started noticing some irregularities. His voice and the way he spoke sounded cold and indifferent. I would think a police officer would be happy to have found someone who was lost on this road for the first time. Another thing that was making me nervous was how unprofessional he was behaving. His answers were vague, and his appearance looked worn out. His uniform was tattered, and his hair messy. And despite there being light from the moon, the police car's headlights, and my flashlight, his face was shrouded in a dark shadow that purposefully was making sure that he was too obscure for me to identify any details. I got back onto my feet and quickly looked down near his waist. I didn't see a holster. Where's your gun? Not important, he replied harshly. I leered at him, my body instantly going into high alert mode. It's very important. Come with me. I'll give you a drive back home. I did another quick analysis of his appearance and saw that there was no radio, no gun, and no badge. That would mean this was no cop. How about we see your face first? I flashed my light up to his face, something I had been avoiding because that would be rude. And that was an instant regret. His eyes were glazed over with a red glow coming from them. The mouth was full of razor-sharp teeth and the skin appeared to be leathery and pale. He echoed. Lunchtime. 
He jumped me, throwing me back to the ground, and kept trying to bite me. It took all my strength just to keep him from getting close to my face. I kept hearing the snapping of his teeth right into my ear, and a desperate struggle ensued. I had no weapon on me, only basic self-defense skills, and this guy had some inhuman strength. Despite his body looking frail and emaciated, his strength was more than on par with mine. I need food. He, it, growled. I gritted my teeth, getting ready to take a huge risk. Removing one of my arms just for a split second, I punched him as hard as I could in the head. Despite the bizarreness of this man, pain was still something that he experienced. His grip released, and he held on to his face. I got back up to my feet and grabbed my flashlights to keep my eyes on him. Now I could see what it was that I did. The entire right side had been caved in. My god, what are you? Despite the impact to the side of his head, he smiled through bloody teeth and said, Merely a puppet. At that, his body started to disintegrate into a pile of dust, and red light streaks shot up into the air and dispersed back into the surrounding forest. I looked around, convinced that what I had experienced was my mind psychologically breaking at this point. When I turned back towards the police car, I thought maybe I could start driving it back, only to be met with a long-abandoned Lincoln car. Looks like I'm still stuck on the road. I sighed. Exhaustion, thirst, and hunger were starting to take their toll on me. I was desperate for something, and now I'm regretting my decision not to have protein bars on me at all times. Every passing minute was a grim reminder that my time was running out. The human body can only survive for three to four days without any water, and from what I could tell, I am well past the first day, and I'm certain that constantly moving is only lessening those precious days that I have left. I could hear them whispering behind me again. The footsteps had grown numerous, like there was a crowd behind me. I was so tired. I needed a moment to rest, but I was too afraid that that would be the last thing that I would do. Out of sheer frustration with my followers, I turned around, half expecting that there would be nothing again. What a regretful decision that turned out to be. This time, I could see who it was. It was a crowd of people. All of their eyes were glowing red, and their bodies looked like they had shriveled up walking limply at me. In the crowd, I saw a familiar face. The drunk driver from earlier was among them. His eyes are glowing red, and his body already looked like it had been drained of all fluids, same as the rest. I turned back and started running as fast as I could. The sweat that grew on me only managed to slow me down as it sapped away more water from my body. I thought for sure that this was a sign that I was going to end up becoming one of them, becoming some sort of shriveled puppet for whatever it is that has a hold on this road. They were still chasing after me, running as well, and not too much longer, I ended up losing steam and collapsing on the side of the road. I was out of breath, drenched in sweat, and my legs were numb. If they reached me again, there was no way I could escape. I heard the sound of a gate grinding shut, then it opened again, then closed again. Looking up, I saw an old, run-down Victorian manor. There was an eerie red glow coming from inside, but what wasn't having a red glow today? Feeling a sudden surge of adrenaline kicking back in, I found the strength to climb up the small hill to reach the front door of this suspiciously abandoned home. Before I receive any judgment... Anyone who was desperate for shelter would have done the same thing, regardless of the obvious red flags. Pun not intended. Kicking the door in, I wasted no time entering, and checked behind me to make sure that my fan club wasn't following me. To my surprise, they were back on the road, but stood there, watching me as I entered. I honestly couldn't tell if that was a good sign or a bad one. Closing the door behind me, I was greeted with chilly, dusty air that kept forcing me to cough. 
I pulled my shirt over my face and moved inside, wondering where that red light was coming from. Inside was a variety of dull, neutral colors of furniture and walls. What was more jarring was the number of taxidermied animals that were littered everywhere. From the walls, to lampshades, to bear rugs, everything about this house was dead, gloomy, and sinister. I went into the kitchen, and sure enough, nothing could be found in terms of food. But I did find water. There was a dirty puddle of it in the sink, and out of desperation I started drinking it, regardless of the health risks. And it was as bitter and rusty tasting as I should have expected. I could only hope that it didn't come back to kill me. Wiping my face with a raggedy towel nearby, I briefly heard something rustling underneath the floorboards. That was enough to tell me that I wasn't alone in the house. But now, I was trapped. My only other choice was to take my chance with the outside where that menacing crowd was waiting for me, or use whatever strength I had left on whatever was hiding in there. I inspected each of the other rooms on the first floor, not even bothering to check the second one. So far, nothing seemed terribly alarming, but I could still hear the sound of footsteps beneath me. They were loud, walking on gravel. I had this sinking feeling that they wanted me to know that they were here. Seeing that I had no other choice, I found one last unopened door. I took a deep breath, and it slowly creaked open, leading to a flight of stairs that descended into a reddish glow that was surrounded by an overwhelmingly sinister blackness that threatened to envelop me should I be brave enough to proceed forward. With a single gulp, I took my first step down and felt the first few droplets of cold sweat. I also felt a nauseating pain in my stomach, but that could be from the water. I took each step cautiously, believing that any moment now the door upstairs would suddenly close like a cliché horror movie. When my foot finally hit the floor, I was surprised that the door remained open, but I was met with a hallway, a long, red, wallpapered, red-carpeted hallway. At this point, I'm starting to become sick of the color red. At least the colors here were a dull shade. Pulling out my flashlight again, the flickering that I was receiving from it was alarming, and I had half a mind to run back up, but I had to know if I was going to be able to live in this house for some time, and the idea of someone else being in it wasn't comforting. I held my flashlight up like a weapon, preparing to hit whatever decided to jump out at any corner that I approached. But no matter how many corners I reached, I was met with another long hallway that stretched roughly twenty feet. My breathing was becoming heavier, and the air was getting warmer. The hallways were growing more vibrant with each turn, and they seemed to change from right to left a lot. At the end of each turn, though, I started to notice something move just out of sight at the next turn. At first, it was tiny, like the back end of a mouse, but each time I reached the next turn, it was getting taller, and I was starting to see more of what it was. Seeing that it was trying to avoid me, I gave chase and prepared myself to start my assault on whatever it was. Out of desperation, all I could think of was to fight everything. My every thought was aggression and survival. And yet, it managed to stay ahead of me at all times, as if it was teasing me. And then, it finally dawned on me that I had run quite some distance. Turning back, I realized that I had made a foolish decision. Everything was getting cleaner and more vibrant still. I had gotten myself trapped. Now, I was stuck in this maze with something always ahead of me managing to move out of sight before I could get a good look at it. Frustration, starvation, and an overwhelming sense of dread made me want to do anything to get out of this maze and not see what was at the end of it. I looked at the wall and used the butt end of my flashlight to start digging a hole through it. I didn't care anymore. I wanted out. I kept chipping away with frantic speed, struggling to tear apart the solid wood wall until it finally collapsed outwards and revealed a monstrous void on the other side. I poked my head out and saw that there was nothing out there. 
a cold, unfathomably deep void that was a grim choice that if I was ever going to get out of here, my only other chance was to keep pushing forward through the maze, or I could take my chances of falling into oblivion. Seeing what my choices were, I took a few steps back, slumped against the other side, and started crying. I never normally did something like that, but the stress, the feeling of entrapment, and this whole situation that stemmed from an act of kindness had led me to an increasing sense of hopelessness that seized every one of my thoughts. I must have kept crying for who knows how long anymore. It no longer matters. No matter what happens today, I'm going to die. I just want to lie here and finally get some sleep. It wasn't the most comfortable bed, but I needed this. I was alerted by the sound of footsteps approaching. My eyes darted open, and I saw that the crowd of red-eyed people were following in after me. They were already at the other end of the hallway, staring me down. Natural instincts kicked in, and I got back on my feet and started running as fast as I could to whatever it was that they were cornering me in. If there is a chance of getting out, I have to take this. I ran and ran, never once taking a moment to catch my breath. I still wanted to sleep, but survival was pushing me forward. It still took me a few minutes to realize that something odd was going on in the hallway itself. It was starting to become warped, blindingly bright in its red colors, and induced petrifying fear into my heart. But then, the red wallpaper was peeling off the wooden walls breaking up into shards, and the red lamps that hung on the sides were falling apart. It was slowly getting darker and darker. I turned on my flashlight just to make sure that I didn't run into a wall, but it flickered erratically, making the way ahead obscure and unpredictable. It didn't matter for too long, because I made it to the end. At the far end of the last hallway was a swirling vortex of black mist. An eerie, white glow across the edge, and red eyes. Of course. They stared at me, as if they were awaiting my arrival. On the ceiling was a black slime that was morphing together and splitting apart, dropping down to the floor. From the vortex of eyes and mist, five long pincers were stretched out, reminding me of praying mantis pincers. When I moved in closer by a few steps, I was compelled to stare into a cosmic maelstrom of impossible depths, and through the swarming array of red lightning at the other end of this unfathomable creature, a pulsing organ, shaped like a heart but covered in wiggling strands of hair and misshapen eyes. The pupils were like that of a goat, and, you guessed it, red. I was disturbed by the crowd of red-eyed people behind me. They stopped their advance as I was making my approach to the anomaly. You have made it. It whispered with a slow and calculated voice. I have, I said, unsure about what to do next. You ran from my grasp outside, entered my home, and your perseverance has brought you this far so that you may see my true form. I took a few more steps forward, peering at the entity with a sudden rush of curiosity. Upon my even closer observation from behind the deathly heart, I swear I could see three figures shrouded in a veil of shadows behind it. But instead of asking any questions, I begged, Let me out! Why should I? I have no reason to spare you. As you can see behind you, I feed on the minds of those who enter my domain. Once again, my fight-or-flight instincts were kicking in, and I was ready to do what I must. But it would be crazy to attack something as abstract and out of this world as this creature was. And then I thought for a moment, could a deal be reached? Perhaps, I swallowed, perhaps we can come to an agreement. A jarring, long pause followed before it said. How so? I, uh, I... I tried to think about what I was going to do. 
if it's anything that I've learned from the movies and TV shows where these types of deals happened, this thing will want me to bring more people and encourage them to drive so that I could snatch them up onto the road. But I wasn't about to sell out my own race. I rationed with myself that I could do something else. Perhaps I should ask it what it wants. Is there anything that you want? Or something that doesn't involve me selling out people to you? If I say no, are you still willing to offer me people to feed on? I took a deep breath and exhaled loudly. If this was going to be where I would die, I was going to go out with a shred of dignity intact, even if that meant having to give up my own life to save others. I don't think I could live with myself by tricking people. No, I care about other people's lives more than my own. I wouldn't be able to live with myself or look my mother in the eyes if she ever found out. I stood there, defiantly, but inside I was shaking and having a horrible case of butterflies in my stomach. How oh, noble, it said softly. All right then, I'll make another deal for you. I can see that you will be most valuable in the future. I'll let you go on the condition that you bring me more creatures like me. What? Disturbing? I thought. Or what I said was, another like you. I am a being known as a primordial. There are many like me on this planet, and I wish to devour them. How am I supposed to do that? I'll give you a helping hand. Plus, there's a war between them, and I'd rather not have my territory and peace disturbed, or my human snacks wiped out over their infighting. That's more doable, I guess, I said, believing it much less morally wrong to sell out another one of these primordials and sacrifice them to this monstrosity. And to make sure that you don't go back on your word. Before I had time to react, one of its pincers extended out too quickly for me to dodge in time, drilling itself into my shoulder and leaving a nasty, blackened puncture wound. Now you'll be forced to bring me my prize. Don't go running away. I have planted myself inside your body and could easily bring you back here should you betray me. I should have guessed there was going to be some insurance for this creature. I was trapped and had to go through with this deal. Now the next means of action was to find another creature like this. The creature's pincers all extended outwards and a loud flashbang hit me before I could look away. My mind left spinning and in utter confusion. And then I heard my name being repeatedly screamed out to me. Adam. 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 I awoke shocked to see that Derek was pulling me out of a car. He dropped me onto the ground, and we both were breathing heavily. Man, you sure are a heavy guy, he remarked. I was quick to realize where I was, and quickly got back to my feet to look for the drunk driver. He wasn't in the driver's seat. Where did the driver go? I asked. Derek slowly got back on his feet and said, You're welcome, and I don't know. He must have run off by the time you got over there. I was smart enough to know that that wasn't the truth. I had to play the part that I was not aware of what truly happened here. I had to fill out a report to the police department and tell them everything that I knew. Well, a manufactured story that would coincide with Derek's side of the story. I took it upon myself to have the next week off desperately trying to drown out my frequent nightmares of whatever it was that I saw with bottle after bottle of vodka and whiskey. But one night, after a rough night of trying to get some sleep, I was disturbed by the sound of an owl. I don't know why this particular owl was able to get me out of bed, but when I went to the window to see how such a creature could be so loud, I was given a grim reminder. That bird had that particular pair of velvet-colored eyes that I had grown to disdain, and it was a warning to me to get to work. 
A sudden rush of piercing pain struck me in my shoulder. When I pulled my shirt down to check it, I could see the black, veiny markings exactly where the puncture wound happened. Weird. This wound disappeared when I got back to town. But that was a warning shot to get to work on finding more of those foul, low-life, primordial things that this... thing... wants. And right before I closed the blinds, I heard it whisper to me once more with a mocking tone. I'm waiting. Get moving, now. Or perhaps you'd like to get your mom in a car next. It seems that there would be no rest for the weary today. I have to get ready now. I have to find something out there. Until I'm able to update, take care. And for the love of God, don't drive at night in a town with a street called Lock Hill Road. <laughs>